Okay, I'm, I'm Paul Stack, and I moved into Riverside in 1974. And I moved into the house I'm in right now, back then. So it's been be 40, what, 44 years this July. Uh, but I, I've known Riverside longer than that. I went to Riverside Brookville High School, and I was on the football team, not particularly notable, and then I was on the wrestling team. I got my letter in wrestling. Um, in 1962, I got a driver's license, so I visited a lot of my friends in Riverside. So I've, I've known Riverside for well over 50 years, and uh, very fond of it. That was prior to cell phones, prior to navigation, and you're going to pick up some date in Riverside, and it's dark, and you got the gas lights, and you can't find anything, and you're driving around like, where am I? Um, I was saying there's a, a, an old story, which I think Riversiders would, would understand. It was a guy who's working on his front lawn, and a uh, driver stops a car and says, how do I get to this address on Olmstead? And the owner says, well, go turn left, and then take the fork, and then go right, and then take another left. And about an hour later, the guy comes by again. He says, now, how do I get to Olmstead? And you go turn left, and then take a fork, and then go to your right. About an hour later, the driver comes by and says, how do I get out of Riverside? <laughs> and that... That really kind of tells the tale in Riverside. I, I have a collection of, of Riverside maps in my desk drawer, and when people stop and say, how do I get to the address, I don't explain it. I just say, pull in the driveway, go inside, get them a map, hand them a map, and show them how to get there on a map. I met my wife in Washington, D.C. I was going to law school at Georgetown. And um, I was working for, while in law school, I was working for a law firm in D.C., and I really wanted to come back to Chicago area. Uh, and so... Uh, she and I started looking around areas. Riverside really didn't have a whole lot of apartments available. So we ended up getting an apartment in LaGrange by the Stone Avenue station. And we spent a lot of time looking at houses in LaGrange, LaGrange Park, and Western Springs, and so forth. But my wife is Bermudian, and she inherited this very large, very old dining table from Bermuda to, from the 1780s. And so we had to find a dining room big enough for it. So we looked around and looked around and looked around, and finally my broker said, hey, I've got a house in Riverside. It's got a big dining room. I said, sure, let's take a look at it. Well, it was this house, and we really liked it a lot, so we ended up buying this house. Uh, when we moved into Riverside, it was a very old community. The people were old, very few children. My daughters went to Blythe Park. There was only one class per grade. I think there were, when my daughter was in first grade, my oldest daughter was in first grade, there were eight kids in the first grade at Blythe Park. Uh, my wife taught Sunday school at the Riverside Presbyterian Church. I think there were like three kids in the grammar school, uh, in the uh, kindergarten class. It was, it was a very old uh, suburb at, at that point, and almost frightening. So I, I don't know that we would necessarily bought into the Riverside if we had known that, because it, it's hard when you know you're you're. I was in my twenties. I was twenty six, I think, when we bought this house. You know, and, and your neighbors are all in their 60s and 70s. And they're nice people, they're lovely people, but you don't exactly have a lot in common with them. And we made some friends with some young couples. Riverside today is, is really transformed. Uh, we have a porch here, and we have chairs, and my wife and I sit out in the evening, and it's a parade of people in baby carriages and walking their kids and kids on bicycles wearing helmets and stuff like that, which we would never have seen. So there has been a, a substantial change in the age of the people who live in Riverside. And also, I think we're getting more professionals. They're, the people here are more highly educated. Uh, that's not to say there were, there were a lot of educated people when we moved in here, but I mean, generally speaking, we're having more, more people with college educations coming in. Um, and and I, I think that it's just, it's, just a, a, it's improved the atmosphere. It's given, I think, a lot of hope for Riverside's continued future here, that we've got all these young families. I had heard of Olmstead, and I had heard of, you know, the kind of the unique way, but, but I, I did not have a real clear understanding um, of, of what was involved in the layout of Riverside. Uh, it was just, Riverside was always unique. I mean, you, you, you could see it. I think the best example I had of that was I was taking off from Midway on a number of years ago to summer. And as Midway takes off, you kind of look and see if you could find your house. And there's this big patch of green surrounded by kind of brown, you know, and it's Riverside. It's very easy to tell. Uh, so, you know, Riverside was unique. The winding roads, the large houses, the large lots, the gas lights. But I hadn't thought of, of its 
place in, in urban development and design of towns and so forth. And I think even now we're slowly becoming uh, acquainted with the importance of Riverside and the overall scheme of things. One of the things I'm working with is I'm trying to get an application together to file with the, the uh, Department of Interior to designate Riverside as a World Heritage Site. Now that's quite a complex job and there are there, there, right now I think there's only 15 World Heritage Sites in the United States and none of them is a, a, a place where people live. Uh, they're mostly national parks and the Alamo and Mount Vernon and Monticello and so forth. Uh, but we're working on trying to get an application in to, the, to, the, to be designated a World Heritage Site. The, the World Heritage Site is, is a, a designation made by the United Nations. It includes things like the pyramids and the Eiffel Tower and so forth. It's, it's a, it, the historic designation we have is, 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 is very important. World Heritage Site is like a whole whole notch above that. Yeah. International. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. So I, I don't know that we've got it, but I think we're working on it, and I'm 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 somewhat optimistic that we'll be able to eventually be able to get it. But I've been trying to work on it, but at the same time I've been have my law firm, and I'm now going sort of semi-retired. I've shut my loop firm down, and I'm got a small office in Riverside, and where I'm kind of widened up my practice, if you will. Bill O'Connor, my partner, is with me as well. And the two of us are going to be in the arcade building, and I think we're we're looking forward to it. We've 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 had run a downtown law firm for I've had I was thirty eight years in the same building, in the Marquette building. And that's a long time. It's thirty eight years. That, I mean, I've been I've been practicing law for forty five years. That's a lot, a lot of getting up in the morning and getting on the Burlington and going. Commuting, yeah, it's a lot say. of commuting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. er, yeah. Early on, when I when I came to Riverside, it, it was funny. I, my wife and I joined the Presbyterian Church, and I wasn't in the church very long when uh, a member came to me and said, we want you to on the library board. And I said, well, okay, that's nice. I was still in my 20s. And why do you want me to library board? She says, because you're a lawyer and we, we don't pay lawyers. And so I said, okay. So I went on the library board, and it was predominantly Presbyterians. And I said, well, that's kind of interesting. And she says, well, that's the way things work. The, the village board are all Catholics, and the library board are all Presbyterians. And that was actually the truth when we came in here. And so there was, there was this, this, this mixture of things. I think that's kind of evaporated now. Now we have a more eclectic group of people, but back then everybody guarded their little, their little fiefdom very carefully. But I was six years on the library board, and that was, that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. That was a good introduction to the Riverside. And, and uh, the library, of course, I love. That was before they did the addition. Uh, we were we knew we needed an addition, and we we my six years we were basically trying to scrape up money to get the thing started. And uh, I have to say, the addition that they did do was just magnificent. I mean, that was that was better than you could ever have done. I think I think our library is is probably the the most beautiful library in Illinois. To tell you the truth, it is just absolutely exquisite. Uh, I know the day I was sworn in as village president in 97, Oprah Winfrey was out here. And she was quoted in the Wall Street Journal as saying that, you know, that this is a beautiful library. She, she just fell in love with the library, so it's a, it's a real asset. I, I was a member of the Union League Club. Well, I still am a member of the Union League Club. And Tony Batko, who lived in Riverside at that time, he's now passed away. Uh, but Tony and I uh, are big library fans. And what was happening in Chicago was engaged in a huge battle about what to do with the library. And it was turning actually into a racial matter. The members of the board were insulting each other and it was just it was just terrible. And so Tony and I went to the Union League Club, which is the Union League Club is a is a is a civic organization. It's not a it's not a social club, it's a civic organization that said we really need to do something. And so they said, go ahead and figure out what it is you want to do. So Tony and I started meeting people relative to the library and finally it became clear to us that until they resolved the issue of where to build a central library. Uh, the library was going to be stymied. At that time, they were going to put the library into the Goldblatt's building, which was an old department store, which was totally unsuitable for a library. State Street? Yeah, on State Street. Yeah. And it, totally unsuitable for a library, just in terms of its layout and everything else. It was just an old department store. The city bought, from, in my opinion, for, for much more than they should have paid for it. It was a dilapidated building. So we said you need to build a new central library. And we immediately ran into resistance in the, the city. The, the, the deals were done. 
there's a chapter in a book called the, the Done Deal Undone, and that was what happened. We then ran into a, in fact, when Tony and I came out with a, a press conference saying we, we think there ought to be a new library, uh, the city council voted 50 to nothing to, to stay in the Goldblatt's building. So I told Tony was kind of despondent. I said, well, Tony, look, you know, it, it can't get worse than that. We can only go up, you know. So we continued. We got hold of the Sun-Times, and we were fortunate enough to get a reporter by the name of Charles Nicodemus, who's also passed away now. And the Sun-Times just bludgeoned the story. It was headline after headline after headline on Sun-Times, on Sunday Sun-Times. And it started off with a front page editorial, which you never see. And it turned into a huge newspaper war because the Tribune wanted it in the Goldblatt's building because the Tribune wanted to empty out the Mandel building, which is where the library was temporarily stored at, which is right next to the Tribune Tower. So, so it turned into a huge battle between, it was, a, it was an old-fashioned newspaper war between the Sun-Times and the Tribune, and Tony and I were caught, caught in the middle of it, the club was. But we figured, well, what the heck, we're here, you know. So we, we went at it, and we went at it, and we went at it. And finally, a group of people intervened on our behalf, including Cardinal Bernadine. And uh, opposition to this thing just collapsed to getting a new building. So when they dropped the Goldblatt's building, they, I got appointed, as well as Tony, by Harold Washington to a committee to build a new library. And we came up with this idea of doing a design-build competition with five teams. And we got five really, really great teams with really great architects, and they had a huge exposition of these model libraries. Uh, so It was so impressive that NOVA did a TV program just on the exhibit of these models called Library Wars, and they had a contest, and I, I was not on the jury that picked it, but there was a, a jury of architects and art historians and so forth. They picked the winning design, and that's what was built, and it, it, it turned out magnificently. It's, it's, it's clearly the finest central library in the world at this point, and that's not my opinion. I mean, that's the opinion of library professionals. It's a beautiful building, even uh, with the, the roof gargoyles and all that kind of business. Yeah, even, even with the roof. Yeah, they're, it's, they're not called gargoyles. They have another gargoyles. name, but yeah, it's a, some, some name, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it, uh, there was, those were hand-carved aluminum, and there was some elderly German gentleman who was carving these things, and the thought was, please get them finished because you're about the only person in the world that can do them. He did. <laughs> yeah, that's quite a story. I, uh, yeah, it was it was it was just funny. It was just it was much more than I bargained for. I was on TV all the time, and uh, I was interviewed by people all the time. And I'm trying to run a law firm at the same time. My 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 partner at that time was Bob Philby, and he was like, "Hey, you know, gee, this is great. You know, I love running a law firm all by myself here." So you were, right. you were possibly the most famous Riverside resident at that time. Well, I don't know if I was. Tony, Tony and I were. We were both from Riversiders. Oh, yeah. And it was kind of an odd thing, because why are these guys from Riverside involving themselves in Chicago? But the, found, the fact of the matter, we found a huge base of support in Chicago among people who used the library. And uh, so it, it, was, it was funny. Riverside got a lot of uh, very good publicity out of it. But the Union League Club did as well. It really wasn't until I was on the uh, RB board. When I got on the RB board at the time. I really did not want to go on a high school board of education. And RB was in such dire financial condition that, that I said, you know, you know, I don't want the school closed. That was a possibility at the yeah, time. Yeah, that was a possibility at the time. It was in such terrible financial condition. Well, I was elected in 1989. That was the time when it, that's when I decided to run. Yeah, and uh, I don't particularly want to run for for local office unless there's really a compelling reason. But that one, there was a real compelling reason. Uh, and uh, it was a very tough situation. You had, RB had no reserves, had no ability to really raise funds because they had exhausted all their bonding power. Uh, the teachers had a contract which made them the highest paid teachers in the state of Illinois. It was, it was just a disaster. I mean, we were concerned about graduating the class of 1990 to get enough funds for them. And we were able to swing some loans from the uh, what was then the Riverside Bank, Riverside National Bank, just to keep the doors open. But it was it was we fired the next year we fired oh goodness about fifteen percent of the teachers. It was it was terrible. I mean it was just it was just an awful situation. Uh, that the they were spending too much money and they were not taxing enough. 
we went out and proposed a tax increase, which, which passed by a two-thirds vote. Um, because I think the public understood, you know, when you, when you fire that many teachers and you still can't balance your budget, you have a real serious problem. So we, um, we got a tax increase and then we got a new superintendent, which we hired from New Trier. And things settled down pretty quickly. But we had student walkouts and we had all kinds of problems back then. It was, it was a very difficult, it was just a very difficult eight years. Well, the first four years were extremely difficult. But things were turned around. Things were turning around, yeah, and, and things were in pretty good shape. But you, like, you have to keep your eyes open, though, because the biggest problem Riverside has got right now is getting really good people to run for these local boards. You have to understand that in Riverside, well, in the state of Illinois, we have more elected officials than any state right now. In Riverside, We've got, in a, in a town of 9,000 people, we've got seven library trustees, seven village trustees, seven grammar school trustees, seven high school trustees, and seven township trustees. So you got this plethora of people. And if there's a vacuum, you're going to get the wrong kind of people coming in there. Either people who think that, hey, I can steer a few bucks to my friends, or you get people that, you know, this is all going to be for my greater glory. And you really need a, a particular type of person who gets in. And uh, there are that kind of people in Riverside, but you just got to get them committed to running. And that's the hardest part right now, is, is, is if there's anything that Riverside needs, it's willingness on the part of its people to step forward and run for these offices. And, and that's, that's hard. I mean, I've tried to recruit these people, and it's, it's very difficult. And it's, it's not always a smooth run. If you have somebody who wants to run for an office and says, look, we gotta get our taxes under control, they're gonna be opposed by the union. And the union has its supporters in town. And so it's, it's, it's a very difficult situation. We have too many elected officials in Riverside, but that's true of every town in Illinois. Brookfield's got too many elected officials. North Riverside's got too many elected officials. And it, it, it's, it's, it, it's splintered. The, the, the demands for personnel are just are just too large. Was that the, one of the reasons you uh, you yourself felt compelled to run for the village board president presidency back in the yeah yeah I, I what concerned me at that point was that the village was looking very dilapidated. The village was not spending money on itself. We had an, a structure that was by the the train station that a car had hit and caught on fire and had been there by itself. This burned out shell for as long as I could recall. You had, it just, it just, they didn't mow the triangular parks. I mean, the village just looked shabby. And, and I said, you know, if, if we, we look at it every day and you get used to it, it's like having a broken window in your house. If you've had it for 15 years, you don't notice it anymore. But somebody comes into Riverside and looks at it, they're gonna say, this town looks like it's on the skids. And I said, let's run and get this thing straightened out. And one of the things we wanted to do was, and the biggest thing was the, the water the water tower. When I was elected village president, we had two water towers. The, the old water tower was built in 1869. The new water tower was built in 1929. And they were both in terrible condition. Where was the new one? The, that's the, oh, the new one? The new one was on Northgate. Uh, and it was kind of tilting, in fact. It was leaking and tilting. It was just a mess. It's gone now. And, and it's gone. So what, what we did is uh, the board, it went very contested hot thing was we finally came up with a plan we got thanks to my my now partner Bill O'Connor who was our state representative got two and a half million dollars from the state of Illinois to build our new water tower and I don't think people in Riverside realize this but our new water tower is not in Riverside it's in North Riverside it's behind Tony Superfoods and our pumping station is in North Riverside it's north of 26th Street so we didn't lose any parkland, we didn't lose anything, but, but things were so hot during that time, it was terrible. We had one meeting after another about what we were gonna do with this, and I remember at one meeting, and I, Don, I don't know if Don was there or not, but, but a member of the audience keeled over and died. Wow. Yeah, and they wanted to go on with the meeting. I mean, it was like, I finally just gambled the meeting to it, to, you know, the, the rule, Robert Rules doesn't say, when I, somebody dies, you're supposed to do this, there's a motion to, you know. But it, 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 was, it, was, it, was, it was just awful. But, you know, it, it really worked out because after the main, the old water tower was decommissioned, 
then Jack Wyduck was village president, and Jack and his board, I thought, did a, a fabulous job of restoring that building. Because before, it was, was just bad looking. It was just flaking paint, and you couldn't do anything. It was holding water. Uh, Jack did a fabulous job of restoring it, and I was really pleased when they did this PBS special, 10 Towns That Changed America. Much of the camera work featured that water tower, and it, to see it restored like that it just was really, really a good feeling. It was, it was good. I started working at the Brookfield Zoo cleaning tables in 1960 when I was 13 at the refectory, which is now the main restaurant. The following year, uh, they put me on what was called a reliever, and I was going around to various areas relieving people for lunch and breaks and stuff like that. And one of the places I relieved was taking tickets at the Porpoise Show, which had just opened in 1960. And I was there with a friend of mine, Ed Kroniak, who was about the same age. And while we were doing the show, the porpoise trainers came down and said, come on upstairs, we need your help. We need you to feed the porpoises at the end of the pool while we perform with the main porpoises so a porpoise doesn't fall on a porpoise. So I found myself, well, pretty soon we're in the show. Ed and I are in the show. What are we? We're high school students. We're now like maybe 15. Uh, and I, I think, you know, this is, this is a job where you just don't have to pay you to do it. You know, I mean, it's just the fact you're getting paid to do this. So Ed and I were the porpoise show. Loved porpoises, loved the zoo. I worked all throughout the, the time. I was there till my last year of law school. I ended up being a policeman at the zoo, along with a lot of other people. And, you know, uh, Tom Whitesell, our police chief, was a policeman at the zoo. And there, there's Pierce McCabe, the village president of Brookfield, was a policeman at the zoo. I mean, this, this area, is, is, that was wonderful training. So I ended up, until my last year of law school, working as a policeman at the zoo. Then I left. And when I came back, I knew Dr. Rabb very well. And uh, he sponsored me for governing membership. So I've been a governing member of the zoo for many, many years. And uh, I, just, I just love the zoo. What an asset. I mean, this is, uh, you know, that to me is, is, again, if you're a young family moving into Riverside, you get a family membership. It's, you, you, you walk there. When, I, when, my daughter, when my daughters were small, uh, I used to take my daughters uh, Saturday morning to the zoo, every Saturday morning, excuse me, <coughs> and let my poor wife sleep late. But I had the time of my life. You, you didn't have to rush through the zoo. You say, let's just see one animal. You could look at a kangaroo for an hour. I mean, they, they, they would, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. They could look at the bats for an hour. I mean, it, it was, it, it is the greatest educational institution you could possibly imagine. And to have it right here in your town. And by the way, part of the zoo is in Riverside. Yeah, uh, well, the porpoises are in Riverside. The old Bear Den used to be in Riverside. The Children's Zoo was in Riverside. <coughs> the South Gate's in Riverside. About a third of the zoo was in Riverside. And I used to, I used to have kind of a running joke with Tom Sequins about because he was president of Brookfield, and I, Tom was a friend of mine when I was president of Riverside. About you know, well, these these porpoises are Riverside residents, you know, and that was the time when Binti Chua the. Uh, the gorilla rescued little boy, and he'd say, "Yeah, but she's a resident of Brookfield." And that's like, what can I say? <laughs> Not, or, you know, well, when, when I was younger, when I was in high school, you had a couple little like delis and so forth, or little restaurants with counters and so forth. They, they were okay. I mean, but you know, I don't know if I put them as favorites. Certainly, when uh, Choo Choo opened up in the arcade building, that was that was a kind of a notch above what we'd ever seen. And I was I was village president at that time, and we agreed to give a hard liquor license to Choo Choo. That was the first hard liquor license we've ever given at Riverside. And um, the board, we were unanimous on that, and the board, the, they gave it. And, but it was basically based upon a premise that it was kind of a high class thing. We didn't want taverns in Riverside. We didn't want bars in Riverside. Uh, and, and it worked. I mean, Scott had that for a number of years, then it, it left. And then he came back to the new one. And Scott and Scott's, Scott has always run a high-end restaurant at the Choo Choo. Uh, I'm rather pleased with Molly's. I think Molly's is a, is a very nice addition to Riverside. Um, and I think that that, you know, that goes a long way. You have the other ethnic restaurants, which have their own clientele. You have the Bohemian restaurant, which I, my wife and I like to go to. And that's, that's kind of a fun restaurant. Um, and you have Riverside restaurant on 
Harlem yeah. Avenue. Yeah, which is which is again is very nice. But um, I'm looking forward to a restaurant coming into the uh, Riverside Center, the new condominium building on uh, Burlington and Long Common. And I'm looking forward for a restaurant coming into the Arcade Building. Those are they, they, both of those buildings lend themselves very well. One of the things that's not understood about our, our downtown area is we did some studies. We actually have a lot of parking in downtown compared to Oak Park and other places in River Forest that have a, a thriving restaurant trade. We actually have a lot more parking, and then the, most of it's free. And so, in fact, all of it's free. So uh, I just think it's a matter of getting the right restaurateur. You know, the, the uh, Riverside Center was built, and then immediately we fell into the 2008 recession. And, and restaurants were badly hurt during that time, so you're not going to get too many new restaurants. But I'm hoping now as things are percolating upward that we're going to get a really good restaurant, really, really good restaurants. We need about five good restaurants in Riverside. It, it is a matter of time. It's a matter of creating an environment for them and, and so forth. And there's only so much the village can do. You can give little tax rebates and stuff like that. But I mean, at the end of the day, the restaurateur has to look and this thing has to stand on its own feet. And, and or, you know, I have to, I have sufficient confidence in it or not. It's expensive to do it. When you open a restaurant, you've got to spend a lot of money buying equipment and, and you know, literally hundreds of thousands of dollars. I'm very, I'm hopeful. I think I'm very hopeful about that. Well, the 4th of July parade was terrific, and it's really, unfortunately, sort of disintegrated because of funding. When we moved here, I mean, the 4th, our 4th of July parade was like something out of a Norman Rockwell painting. I mean, it was a big parade. You had bagpipers, you had marching bands, you had all sorts of activities. And the village stopped funding it, and they've been trying to do it privately out of funds and then and they're doing I and I I respect that I respect them for trying to do it privately but the fact of the matter is that that so many people used to come to Riverside people used to have all their friends come in from Chicago into Riverside to see the 4th of July parade and these people would come in and say wow what a great town and as I said it's like a Norman Rockwell moment that's not happening anymore you see we used to I remember I would a couple times when I was village president you would go over the railroad tracks I would be riding either the original fire engine or one of the, some old car that they got. And you come around, there's a huge crowd of people, giant crowd of people. And I went with this time and looking, it's a, it's a fraction of what it was. So some governmental entity needs to pick up the tab. And yeah, well, I'm looking at Riverside Township. Okay. I think Riverside, they're the one entity that, that has extra funds. They got a lot of extra funds and, and they, they should be picking up the tab for the for the Fourth of July parade in Riverside and in North Riverside. They could do that very easily. And and you know, as I said, Riverside government itself doesn't have any extra funds. I mean, I, I know that for a fact. And there is no other there is no other entity. I would like to see North the Riverside Township pick it up. Yeah, without the Friends of the Fourth, we wouldn't have any parade. I mean, they've been keeping the thing alive. And and uh, you know, I think Joanne Cozy and Joe Ballerine and the other people. Have done a very good job with the Friends of the Fourth, but they're just, they, you know, they're they just don't have the resources that they used to have. These bands want money. The bagpipers want money. The, you know, the dance troops want money. They all, you know, everybody everybody's looking to 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 make fun, and we we just don't have that resources. And it's it's getting to the point like right, we've got the RB band, we've got Little League, and then we got politicians. And that's that's not what I want to see on the floor. That's not Norman Rockwell. <laughs> That's not even close to Norman Rockwell. It's closer to Stephen King. Uh, I love scouting. When, when I was president, um, we, the, Chief Kraczewski and, and I came up with this deal where we could have the scouts sleep overnight in Swamp Pond. And it was great. They pitched tents and the kids were, you know, there was owls hooting and everything else out there. And the kids just had a great time out there. I don't know if that could be done or not. I don't know if, it was, if, if it's been too badly deteriorated from the work that was done on, yeah, from the overflow. But that, that was wonderful. I love scouting. I'm an Eagle Scout. So it, it, camping is a huge, huge, huge deal of scouting. And if you want to keep a kid in scouting, Girl Scouting and Boy Scouting, you got to go camping because that's really the exciting part of it. You can only do, you know, tying knots so long. And, and uh, uh, I'd love to see, I really think scouting is a good group. I think it's really an excellent group. And I, I'd, I'd like to see they do it. And I'd like... Uh, I'd like to see the kids not only just sleeping on Scout Cabin, but sleeping outside. 
you know, mm. alongside Creek. Man, there's all sorts of animals out there at night. You got raccoons and beavers and everything else crawling around out there. It's wonderful. <laughs> we're not we're not a village in a forest. Uh, no, no, that was that's a that's a minority view. I do not accept that we're in a village in a forest. And Olmstead certainly never intended us to be a village in a forest. We're park. We're in Olmstead Park. And the place that's closest to us is Prospect Park. And if you look at how Prospect Park was laid out, it is an original creation by Olmstead. There's a waterfall in Prospect Park, and when they turn it off, you'll find out that Olmstead put a giant valve there. I mean, it's not anything that was there naturally. This is an artistic creation of Olmstead. And this idea of village in a park is, 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 or a village in a forest is just wrong. That, was, that, was, that name appeared, that phase appeared when I was village president. I don't know where it came from, but I, I don't agree with it in any way, shape, or form. We're a village in an Olmstead park. We are the only people who live in an Olmstead park. Uh, I mean, you have, if you could imagine how much a house would be worth if it was the only house in Central Park, yeah, or in Prospect Park, or in any of the other parks of Riverside. We are, we, are, we are it. We're the only people that live in an Olmstead Park. And it is uh, a singular honor. And I don't know why we would want to kind of obscure the thing by saying we live in a forest, because we don't. For the people who don't know, explain about uh, Prospect Park. Where, where... That's in New York, uh, New York City. And uh, there's, there's two great parks in, in, in New York Central. City. One is, of course, a Central Park, which was the, you know, the, the thing that put, that I think is on the World Heritage Site. Uh, and the other one was Prospect Park, which would, kind of fell into disrepute. And it got rebuilt 40 years ago, 30 years ago, so forth, and restored. And it really is quite a beautiful park right now. But my, my wife and I have been to a number of the, the Olmstead Parks, you know, the Emerald Necklace and down in uh, Tennessee or Kentucky and, and so forth, and, you know, the Boston and so forth. Mm -hmm. But they're all parks. There's nobody living in them. We live in it. And, and the, Olmstead only designed one of these. He only designed one suburban park where people could live. Everything else was a park itself. We're, we're it. I mean, that's, that's a huge part of the uniqueness of our condition. So I think, to me, calling it a village and a forest just disparages what, it, it diminishes what we really are living in. Uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity. Well, thanks, thanks again for uh, letting us into your home. Okay, thank you.